now we now we are live. Um, I have two special guests. Uh, we have Pullman, the absurdist, and Proper Terrain Joe. Today we're going to discuss the the birth and the decline of Western civilization and go over a it goes over and we're gonna go over you go over the uniqueness of the West. Um, you two want to introduce yourselves. Well, that was a good introduction, I think. Yeah, I've been on Voltaire's uh, streams before where I talked about absurdism and proprietarianism with Joe over here. Yeah. And yeah. Go ahead, Joe. Yeah. Yeah. Same here. Uh, obviously, hence the name. I'm a proprietarian. Uh, and more or less, it'll be, it'll be a big topic we're covering. So it might take a little bit. However, uh, I think we've got laid it out, or we got at least laid out. Uh, Quite nice. Yeah. And both of us owns um, a proprietary Discord server, and we're helping yeah. Doodle with all his little things, which has also been uh, a bit, one can say, influenced our train of thought, at least about the West. But uh, Joe, you're gonna start. You have a little thing. You're gonna start yeah. in here, yeah. beginning describing. Yeah. So obviously explain the, uh, to get, because obviously I think we're all, at least both us, all three of us here, and I guess whoever the viewers on, at least within the certain mindset that the West is either in some form of decline, or at least in some form of under attack, or perhaps just sort of weakening, contraction, or whatever synonym you want to use. Uh, but the story, we all we'll obviously understand that point, but we have to understand what led to that and what exactly does make the West unique. And furthermore, how did this begin? Where did the West begin? And how it, the fact that it is declining, at one point it must have grew to very large proportions of importance, well, at least within the world. And this is, can obviously be seen through a whole entire historical analysis. But to the start off, obviously we have to get within prehistory. And there's a lot of contention about this. And this is a, there's a lot of crap that goes around about you know whether or not we came from Africa uh the, the status of crow magnon and whatnot so for the sake of the argument we're going to have to skim most more or less some of the prehistory and we have to accept more or less the uh the more the non-contested and more or less accepted academic view that um life homo sapiens essentially began some period within africa a couple of tens of thousands years, years ago hundreds of thousands years ago and then population boom within that region forced larger migrations uh waves of migrations out into the old world, eventually reaching its way into Australia. But um, a, a very important point that happened there is that within ha haplo haplo groups, or certain movements of certain uh, groups, there's something uh, a unique effect happened somewhere within the Central Asia region or Afghanistan primarily, and it, it so far it's quite unknown, but it seems to be re related with the ability of like higher cognition more or less, and this uh, haplo group is called HB1. And judging from its movement patterns, it basically made its way from Central Asia, uh, spread a little bit to surrounding regions, India and uh, Persia, but curved its way all around up into basically what is now in old Europe. And this is a primary haplogroup group where many of uh, old Europeans belong to. And just like any movement pattern, this requires long, large waves and large groups. Uh, they crossed an area around the, uh, the Caspian Sea and what was by then the Black Sea, uh, what happened with the Black Sea was more or less kind of how what Doggerland used to look like. Uh, sort of the land was sort of pristine and uh, it, it was kind of below sea level. But it, it, no, there we go, my dogs are going off. But a hypothetical event happened around that time where it, it's known as the Black Sea Deluge. Basically, what happened is the same effect happened in Doggerland, where the, the sea kind of, uh, due to its rising sea levels from the ice caps, the sea level rose and the Black Sea formed to what it is now. You can see the Crimean Peninsula. That's more or less all thanks to um, flooding, large floods within that area. And this pretty much split off uh, what was that whole entire migration group or by that time. Old Europe was pretty much cut off from the rest of the old world thanks to that. Uh, and pretty much you get the divide between what is the old Europeans and the Indo Draftian people or the very old Indian people around that time. Uh, and what essentially formed around this region, uh, what where the steppe lands flooded along the um, the above the Caucasus and right above the central the uh, Central Asia regions, 
are basically steplins. They're, they're pretty much almost like a like a, a sea that's been completely removed of its uh of its water. It's just completely flat land, barely any trees, barely any rivers, uh, mostly just plains. And around that time, uh, there a population there that stayed and didn't move directly into northern Europe, but stayed in that stepland. Uh, more or less lived out in, like a like any other stepland. Like you see within Mongolia, they live a very nomadic lifestyle. Uh, it's very pastoral. It focuses on um, basically grazing and herding. Uh, these people, thanks to the uh, benefit of modern uh, anthropological linguistics, uh, can be known as the Indo-European people. And there, there's also a lot of contest uh, to, within sort of uh, any books that are around this Indo-European group. There's a lot of talks about you know whether or not they're, they're simply just a uh, just a linguistic group. But in reality, I mean, half the world pretty much speaks an Indo-European uh, Indo-European language. And there isn't much contention about other stepland groups that are are actual people, natural cultures. For example, the Mongolians themselves with the Khanates and the Turks, which used to be a very nomadic people that came in, overran, and basically uh, ruled over foreign people around that time and displaced some populations here and there. But as far as we know, the Indo-Europeans themselves are a specific population and are a very specific culture, uh, no less different than the other stepland cultures. And most interesting about them is that, as far as what any sort of archaeological findings can view, they were basically the first Stepland uh, culture that focused much on riding on the horse. Obviously, there is the uh, the classic, you know, Genghis Khan with his hordes of uh, Mongolian soldiers riding on horses, but uh, it's believed sometime around like 4800 BC, the Indo-Europeans were the first to domesticate the horse. Uh, Thanks to this pastoral lifestyle, the, their whole entire um, agriculture has been based around um, basically uh, uh, herding, herding, and domesticating these animals: ox, cows, sheep, and horses. And this economy gave very much a rise to a culture very similar to other uh, stepland people. For example, I think there was some kind of quote. Uh, m- many of the Quotes from Genghis Khan and other Mongols who viewed civilized societies, these uh, grain and wheat agriculture type uh, cities, as more or less also domesticated animals. So it's a very uh, elitist sort of view that these people have. And now, thanks to the domestication of the horse, this pretty much led to a great chance of mobility. I mean, the fastest thing at that time used to be human feet. And the only thing fast that was our animals. And it came to a point where you domesticate an animal that's very fast. I mean, faster than anything that's at least not within the region of Africa, which probably was a cheetah. The horse offered great range and great mobility. Now, obviously, there's a... Sorry. Sorry, everyone. A lot of horses. Yeah. Sorry, my phone went off. There's heavy contest. Uh, uh, now, there's obviously a, a myriad of different pressures for these groups to move out. But as far as we know, whether it uh, be a, through a culmination of both um, scarcity within the region of the steppes for food and grazing, grazing, grazing areas, or perhaps just uh, for prestige seeking, which is a topic I'll focus on a little bit later here, they pretty much intrude themselves into old Europe around, I think it was like 4,000 4, of. Uh, to 4500 BC, we actually see, do see intrusions thanks to the Kurgan burials um, into basically what was southeastern Europe or uh, sort of the Romanian Bulgarian region around that time. And so we get two separate cultures for the Indo Europeans. Uh, from the south, we know them as the Yamna culture and the Quarter Ware to the north. Uh, the Yamna would be basically their, their linguistic group would basically be the formation of what we know for the Celtic, uh, the Latin and the Slav- Slavic groups. Actually, no, that would be the Cold War, my bad. Well, the Cold War would be known for its Germanic, uh, Slavic, and Baltic languages, although during that time it will be known as Balto-Slavic, but it, they split off in the future. Now, the, fo- the back on that point where I made about the region, one of the, one of the myriad of reasons why they invaded or migrated, I should say, into Old Europe, was that of them basically being no different from any other uh raiding culture 
you know, around that time they brought bronze from the south, the wheel uh, from the west, and the horse from the east, and pretty much combined chariot warfare into a sort of a raiding type of culture. And this culture was very prestige orientated. Uh, it's focused within Duchesne's uh, studies and within his books. It, everything was basically centered around that of going into uh, your enemy's territories and, well, my, my is killing them, uh, gain glory in battle and to gain all the goods and loot. I mean, gold, uh, wares, and furs, and all, all sorts of goods. And the culture that based off, and what, what built off of that is a kind of culture where it is more or less not based on perhaps some sort of um, not necessarily a collectivized identity, I'll say there was some, but more or less within a sense that is aristocratic, that being of uh, that there are certain individuals within that society that are higher than the rest. Now, Duchesne wants to point out that the difference between these kinds of societies uh, compared to other societies that also had an aristocracy around their times as well, China, old India, uh, Egypt, well, he, he referred to it as aristoc as an aristocratic egalitarian culture. And, and the way he explains this, what he means by aristocratic egalitarian, or it might seem sort of a, a contradiction, is that within these kind of polities, within these societies, the king, in fact, did rule, and he also was a sovereign. However, he saw his fellow aristocrats, his fellow nobles, and these noble families also within equal range of power, while in differences maybe within Mesopotamia, uh, where capital is much more centralized on the river valleys, there, yeah, you know, the king basically ruled every single estate, and basically he lorded over also these nobles as well. You know, sort of scene where um, the king often punished these nobles that were below him. You also see everyone as a control frame. This is where sort of god kings come from. Uh, now where, where this comes from, and far as far as we know, why the West developed these kind of um this aristocratic egalitarian culture where we can trace back to sort of studies within legal anthropology now with any tribal group the um basically after the hunter gatherer society and the agricultural revolution there was basically a gain in productivity and a greater gain in accumulation of food and products uh, what was basically this used to be a sort of a marxian fallacy on prehistory where instead, although yes, indeed, that the fact that the hunter gatherer societies did in fact um, distribute uh, e equally, this is more or less a sort of a rationing kind of uh, survival strategy, as food is much more scarce than it would be during the ag agricultural revolution, and especially compared to uh, today. So survival was very much on a thin line here. Um, now, uh, within legal anthropology. Uh, an event happens. This can be observed with um, the Yamana culture, or not Yamana, but within the um, within Polynesian societies, certain ones, uh, specific ones that are very, not connected to Hawaii necessarily, but there are specific people, uh, specific individuals within those kind of uh, tribal societies that happen to have greater intuition of the land, and happen to be just better producers overall compared to the rest. Uh, when it comes when it comes to certain uh, techniques in agriculture these these men eventually uh gained enough uh compared to everyone else where basically had a stockpile uh, of foods whether it be wheat fruits uh or even sheep you know um even the pastoral economy this is the case well what happened would be to sort of ease the tension of this kind of what would be sort of a class uh differentiation or different or difference uh inequality so to speak what would happen with these certain individuals is that they would begin offering feasts to everyone within the tribe or festivals if you prefer another word term and what would happen in these feasts is that he would basically flock his ability as knowledge of the land to others and offering them food and if they were to take this acceptance into the feasts or festivals they would be uh th this would be basically demand to be reciprocated either by obligations in the future or basically by gifts right there in the present. You know, you go to a party and you offer someone in exchange for a gift. And uh, within these tribes, these big men's status is actually very important because um, there'd be, it'll almost be to the point where people will be competing for big men. 
it's almost like a sort of a, a high point where you want to be. And so everyone was, whether it be pastoral or simple agricultural, based on um, just uh, harvests, everyone's competing for it. Everyone's competing for the big man says certain individuals, obviously. And what happened within societies is eventually those who wish to um, become big men it would form very complex tribal societies, that being which basically um, sort of these log cabin kind of uh, groups of uh, young gentlemen would form. And they would all center around these certain big men, and they would all basically reciprocate their, them being under their protection and also being under the uh, the wing of this big man to also help them out and cooperate within this uh, this sort of little clique. And this would basically demand almost a high trust kind of little microcosm of a polity there. And as far as we know, and as far as we know through like any sort of Indo-European studies, this created the high trust society, the aristocratic egalitarian culture we know of today, of these groups of nobles under this um, this sovereign, this king, who saw them as equals, and saw them as brothers in arms, essentially. And this would transcend through also through Greek and Roman times. Now back onto the uh, observations on, on these sort of gentlemen. Rather than focusing now on the big man concept of simple agriculture, this is also based on a war ethic as well, as these were raiding people. And they'd go in, they'd fight battles, and their brothers in arms would also go with them on their horses and on their chariots. And everyone would be prestige seeking, not in the sense of just only within uh, victory, but also getting goods as well. You can see this within Kurgan burials, thanks to the uh, Gwimbata studies. Uh, she was able to find Kurgan graves. They're basically oval shapes. And you would find these men who were adorned not only with their weapons, uh, which is actually kind of unique to other sort of burials, uh, it was also adorned with all their clothing. They, uh, it's been observed that Indo-European people tend to be very wear very lavish kind of um, attire. It's almost sort of flaunting. And also with a lot of uh, jewelry as well. Now, uh, after this period, obviously, it came to the point where um, I think the Yamna culture eventually made its way into Greece. And what we know is the Mycenaeans invaded south into there. And we also know the Homeric epics and the Mycenaean cultures. It basically overtook Greece within that time. I think it was sometime around maybe 3,000. I might be wrong there that they made their intrusions finally into Greece, the Mycenaeans did. Uh, and I'll have to skim over my Greek history a little bit here, because archaic Greek history can be a little bit uh, crazy here and there. But the, basically what happened afterwards, and the Mycenaeans took over and implemented this sort of um, aristocratic culture onto these old, old people. Uh, the Mycenaean civilization eventually fell, as many do, uh, over a meter of different reasons, should probably mostly due to overextension. If I did get right to the Greek uh, city-states that I think I'm pretty sure we're all familiar with here. And obviously there's Athens, which formed itself into democracy, and Sparta, which formed itself into basically what was a stratocracy or military rule. And both of these implemented very high trust uh, ethics, what used to be uh, the ethic of Arete within Indo-European civilization or Mycenaean culture. Uh, that being of highly warlike and basically very prestige orientated. Uh, what happened within these small the area the era of the polis was that of the ethic of sophrosyne, that being of self restraint, that being of sort of control, and this was very apparent within the Greek city states. Oh, hi there. No. Voltaire's no, it's a, Voltaire crashed, and now we have Voltaire's face. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what do you expect from Voltaire? All right. Uh, yeah, back on topic. Uh, also, you know, the polis area. And basically, within the democracies of Greece, or no, well, Athens, I should say, within that city state, it, it required uh, everything was basically based on vote. It was basically required by high demand to trust one another, to basically trust that you would pull together these uh, sort of um, policy makings and to ensure each other you're, that you're not basically making up a bunch of bullshit and lying. And Sparta was based on the military ethic and sort of continued it based from um, Indo-European ethics of um, reporting, military reporting, where you wouldn't load, you wouldn't overframe, you wouldn't make inflations. You simply would 
you have a scouting party they would go out they observe where the enemy is or where mm, possible raiding uh possible sites for raiding would be and went back to their commanding officer and so reported you know i saw this at this time this also continued the level of high trust ethics and truth telling within western civilization and i'll see they all went in as brothers in arms towards the enemy and either killed them all or defended and this came into light when the persians finally came into the west and they invaded through greece and then you have the classic story you know uh you have Thenians on, on at the sea uh attacking the greek fleet and the spartans on the land attacking the spartan army and you get the classic old story at marathon and whatnot and the west survived it, it survived a great invasion it, rather than decline what, what used to be what what would but most people like to see how the West would decline through outside invasion. They they did primarily well against outside invasion against the Persians. You know, they drove them back. They basically fucked up Persia for a while. And they still, and although they all pretty much joined together in alliance, they still, after the war, they all maintained relative um, autonomy within the city-states, Greece, uh, Athens, and uh, Sparta especially. But what led to the downfall of Greece well, I, I, I should probably say after that fact, most importantly, is that after a while, after the wars and after the main events of the uh, that of the Gre Greco-Persian War, um, one of the biggest rises within the West especially was that of philosophy and that of sort of the uh, classic philosophy we know of and that basically everyone sort of studies. And it really starts off with um, Aristotle, it, he, obviously the man. Uh, now, there's a lot of contest. There's also a lot of argument whether or not Socrates existed. Uh, a lot of people think that Plato made him up. I'm, we'll safely take the argument that we should believe, at least for the very least, that Socrates of some form existed in real life. And he introduced the idea of basically criticism, that of questioning the state of nature and that of the order. And although, uh, along with that, not only that, but also the acceptance of that fate and order, you can see that where he, uh, within the Republic, he questions what is justice. And, but also seeing the, the acceptance of fate and of that of nature, nature and order, he accepts when basically the, uh, the city state basically demanded his death. And, you know, he, he drank poison with confidence and died. And afterwards comes his disciples, uh, Plato being a, the most important one. He continued the the Aristotelian, uh, Aristotelian, uh, Aristotelian, the Socratic method of questioning what about the uh, our basic understandings of nature, and to all, not only that, but also continue, basically also further continue the acceptance of that order and that of that nature. Uh, Plato was born to an aristocratic family, and it shows with his ethics. Uh, he viewed the world mostly you, you can see this also within a lot of talks about politics he basically viewed the philosopher king as the highest end goal for a civilization and its state he viewed that specific ethics were only attained for a specific few of that aristocratic kind of that philosopher king mindset and basically everyone else is pretty much hung left to dry more or less uh and one another important Thing that come out platonic view or idealistic view is that of his ideal world of forms that being that uh truth is not necessarily gained through objectivity uh through objective material understanding although it's really helpful he also doesn't decline uh also doesn't you know reject that it is through a pure ideal world of our understandings i mean you can see this through the symposium you know it, you have to n basically know geometry to be allowed in and uh, once again, a continuation of his very aristocratic elitist mindset. And he was basically birthed what we basically the foundation for metaphysics, idealism, and all the branches that left off from there. Uh, continuing on, another important branch that came out from uh, the site who was a disciple of Plato was out of Aristotle. Now, Aristotle, basically the same, the exact same um, Socratic understanding, questioning, the same Socratic method. But one of his main differences compared to him in Plato was that he did not rely on ideals. He did not think of these concepts of the ideal world of forms as necessarily a true method of understanding the world. He really, he only really, uh, merely viewed it through what can be observed within reality. This is where you get sort of the uh, the four, the five elements, and 
the Earth is the center of the universe and the world's uh, all the other planets move around it. Simply what he observed, he observed that other celestial bodies move around and he observed the levels at which um, objects rise based on their density or buoyancy. You know, uh, Earth was the lowest, water is second, uh, air is third, fire is fourth, and then ether, which is fifth, that being basically space. But even more important than that, one of the most things that I think of that will also transcend is that of the of his ethics. And I think ethics also play into the future as well. Um, that being that instead of what Plato's view was of the ethics of being very much elitist, uh, Marisol's ethics were almost no different. Now, sure, it was based on how to be the most just and how to be the most moral and how to be the most ethical. But it was for the everyman. It was it was it can apply to everyone and to reach this just level. Now this can also be, this is basically the highest point he believes that a human can be just, and this should also be applied to what would be an aristocracy as well. But rather than being elitist, Plato pretty much accepted that anyone could follow these uh, ethics, the Nicomachean ethics. Uh, now continuing off from that, we'll have to go return to a point in time and to focus on why did basically the decline now and although greece did fairly well well you know it fought off invaders and it grew to the point where it was able to form philosophy and these uh it was still able to flourish i mean it almost started what would be an industrial revolution thanks to copper but what it caused its decline was its division internally you can see this within the peloponnesian wars in which um athens and sparta formed their own different leagues and started killing off each other they started to fight this is almost no different than what we observe in the future of that of the land-based Germanic military ethic versus the seafaring trade faring uh, Anglo ethic. Uh, it won't just only divide in the microcosm of in within Greece. And although while uh, Sparta won more or less, they both fell out of the power eventually. And although they won a war that was very taxing for both of them, and there was a clear victor, Sparta still eventually fell out of the power, and what happened afterwards it would be what is more or less a Caesarist uh, cycle of Western civilization, in which Macedon, after that period of time when Sparta and Athens fell out of power and basically fell into corrupt olig oligarchy, or just uh, basically into a shell of its former self, Macedon basically grew in size, and we get Alexander the Great that's birthed out of that, and was... Although able to reform and unify Greece once again, and he basically conquered the old world and what basically was the known world around that time, uh, he was able to spread the Hellenistic worldview into the old world. It the same reasons why Rome would fall in the future is that of overextension. You know, once Alexander fell, there's basically no reason for Macedon to be able to hold itself back up. And so Greece finally fell, and Macedon finally fell. But during this time, uh, the Romans came into power. And now the Romans were... Not, their model is actually very interesting. Obviously, they, within history, they used to be a monarchy, and they overthrew their monarch in a form of um, what be known as an aristocracy with two consul presidents. Uh, their ethics were entirely stoic. They were very much uh, not primarily based on the Aristotelian ethic per se, but they didn't fall into the idealist trap within the Platonic worldview, you know. Uh, they they grew within size, but never suffered through overextension for during their time in the Republic. The only problem within, once again, the only problem because they had no problem with invaders. They, although they almost got you know thrashed by Carthage, they came back and destroyed them in the future. And through other battles, they were able to almost destroy Carthaginian armies. What happened to Rome, the Republic primarily, I should focus on, and why it fell was internal struggle. You know, there was, just like in the old times, um, the reasons why the Council of Plebes formed was uh, a while back when there was only that of the um, the patricians and only that of the consuls. There was an invasion, basically a war going on, and basically the invaders at the time were at the gates, and they wanted to conscript basically everyone at that time to defend, but the plebes didn't want strict conscription they wanted reciprocity they demanded their contribution and what they demanded was um avail their introduction into the body politic as well and that's where we get basically the, the 
the um, House of Plebes around that time within Rome. And to continue on, uh, basically that, that almost over blew thanks to the division between the patricians and the plebeians during the end times of the Republic in which the uh, what was going to form was essentially a demand for a dictatorship to represent the plebeians and is something with the neo-reactionary thought that the high versus the, uh, the the middle versus the high and the low in which the, the high that being the higher class or the dictator or the king would align stuff with the lower caste to basically undermine the middle. And this can be seen, obviously, through future, future endeavors as well. And this eventually gave rise to the Caesar cycle of the West as well. Eventually, it literally gave rise to Julius Caesar. And who, he himself, actually, um, although being from the nobility, he, uh, his, you know, his, his, the family that Julius came from was relatively poor around that time. I mean, their, their family never actually really held power for a while when Julius actually went to, before Julius went to power. And the empire, once the Republic reformed itself into an empire, it spread just like Alexander's empire. And it, it was able to do great at its conquering. Its only problem was internal division over a myriad of problems. And it eventually came to the point where it was so weak internally that when the Huns came by and when the Germanic tribes came in, uh, Rome basically fell on its own weight. And all it needed was a little push. And it, this is... Uh, one of the main arguments I'll try to point here is that the reason why the West falls necessary from outside contact necessarily, although that can be one of the main factors, what we can observe through history is that internal struggle and the inability to cooperate and the inability to reciprocate within the, the West is what permanently causes its downfall. And now uh, we'll find that we're now getting out of what, what happened after the end of Rome, what, what happened after West Rome fell was that the Dark Ages and essentially mm -hmm. that of a new period, an era. Yeah, and all that era brings in new different ideas and philosophy that shaped how we are today. I'm gonna say actually, yeah, the the Christian era after Rome fell has kind of shaped how it is today. Well, Rome's fall was the beginning of something new, I would say. Uh, uh, are you done with the first? Yeah, chapter? yeah, go ahead. All right. Uh, we're going to continue with the second chapter, but there's a question here. Uh, someone asked. Hmm. Uh, I don't have uh, a answer. Uh, I'm going to ask it. Uh, uh, Banshee Bomb asks, why is proprietarian preferable to neo reaction? Neo reaction? Uh, mm -hmm. Well, the problem with neo reaction, more or less, if you want to just go through Mench's mold bugs sort of critique, I mean, Obviously, I, I, I am uh, I would consider myself part of the neo reaction. Uh, oh, Banshee, I think I talked about him before on the Chill Tom server. One of the main problems within, uh, I mean, market fascism, the political the concept that Kurt and proprietarianism based off is basically just built off of neo cameralism only rather than simply a um, joint stock republic. It just pretty much forms the government, uh, parliament into markets and exchanges. One of the main problems, although Neo reaction gets its critique of of um of democracy quite correct as, as well as many other critiques of democracy by many others. It it fails to answer the problem of how to maintain trust within society and how to observe falsehoods. Obviously, we can simply state that uh, with a neo reaction, that's it. Democracy is objectively a worse way of achieving liberty compared to uh, say any other variant form of governing. Um, it people within government lie more or less, and it's hard to detect these falsehoods. People try to gain in, and people try to attain power through basically maneuvers. And when people try to push bullshit policies, that basically the the average layman, the hoi polloi, or a lemming, or a NPC, what have you, can't detect it. Then there there's no way of, of maintaining the high trust society. It gets undermined, and you get. Uh, what are basically low trust people, liars, parasites that come into the body of politic and continually deceive and just extrapolate gains out of it. And so what proprietarianism hopefully tries to do, once again, it, although there's many contestions and debates whether or not mm, proprietarianism is even neo-reactionary, I consider it a part of the branch of post-libertarian thought along with neo-reaction. Uh, it, it solves the problem 
of detecting falsehoods, detecting lies after the removal of democracy. And that's, uh, that's how I, I personally view it. All right. Mm -hmm. No, see, I got sidelined there. You got sidelined, but that was the point a little bit. Um, so I'm going to go back to actually Aristotle and Plato a bit, but I want to talk about the, the idea of monotheistic God, first of all. Uh, for everybody who, who doesn't know exactly what I do, uh, I, fo I, I study religion. I focus around religion, and my area of expertise are religion. So I want to focus on the idea of God real quick because it's actually very important through Western thought, at least the concept of monotheism. Uh, so what happened after, well, if you believe Jesus existed or not, that doesn't really matter. Uh, Jesus actually, was black. We all know this. Oh, well, he was from Palestine, so he was brown. <laughs> uh, well, no, they were actually, weren't they whiter during the time? Um, well, they, weren't, they weren't Arab buys because the uh, Arab conquest hadn't happened during that time, so they're more or less a yeah. uh, branch of Phoenicians or whatever. They're yeah. probably tanned, like any other Mediterranean. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah. Uh, they weren't a bunch of hairy Arabs. <laughs> oh, oof. Well, anyways, uh, actually, that's not the important part. The important, uh, well, it doesn't matter. I'm, I'm, I'm going <laughs> to take it from a more secular point of view. I don't want to say if Jesus is real or not. That's not the point. But in... I don't remember exactly the year, 200 and something, something. Uh, the, f the first meeting in Nicaea, when Constantine, Emperor Constantine of Rome, decided to make uh, the Christianity as the main religion and started to define what Christianity is. That is the start of a new, also a new era, <laughs> at least in pl uh, Platonic era in the West. Uh, Plato wasn't still... Uh, influenced influencer very much during the Roman era, but with the start of Christianity and Christi and Roman thinkers could start thinking about God instead, the a, a Platonic idea started to grow. And one of the most important thinkers during the time is August of Hippo, which uh, brought into a new <clears throat> way of thinking with using God. Much of the Neoplatonic or Platonic way of thinking thinking is that there is an ideal world that is perfect, and then there's our world, meaning that you do your actions the way you do them, but there is a right way to do them in this ideal world. Plato only, because he's an elitist and follows most of his uh, uh, aristocratic ideas, who only believe that a sect of few elite people could know what is right and wrong from this ideal world. But with, the, with, the, with an idea of God, then you all of a sudden have an entity that can bring you this right and wrong idea that is not a human that Plato talked about. Because Plato, Aristotle, and Socrates weren't, weren't monotheists. They might have been religious, but they're not in any way religious in the concept that we have it right now in the West we follow the, the aspect of a god and this is the connection between the ideal world that plato talks about and humans so when when it started with august augustinus he said that he said many different things but he said mostly that with your faith in god society will kind of do the right thing. It will, it will bring to the right thing as long as God is giving it to you. <laughs> yeah. And this idea was existing for about a thousand years, meaning this is a lot to do with the, also the monarchistic way of thinking that, ah, oh, it's God giving it to me. So much of what Augustus was doing, it was just the idea that everything is right because God says it's right. I only have to believe, ask, and pray, and it is right. Anything that happens, my wife being murdered, my people above me, which is the kings and arist uh, elites of the society doing what they're doing is right because God. So much of it was God. It, him himself had issues with it, right? But his ideas brought forward to that. I remember uh, 
Augustus actually complaining about quite quite quickly after he started talking about this idea, they already corrupted it. And he saw the corruption actually happen himself. He saw in uh, Constantinople or whatever it was back then, leadership, them using God for their for their corruption, which is kind of funny. He started an idea of this Neoplatonic idea that later corrupted during his own lifetime. But regardless of that, there are many good things of it, but corruption was one big part of it, sadly. And that was about for a thousand years. We have the Dark Ages during this time, we have different uh, ideas during the time, but faith with God and uh, the traditional society was there because of it. Because you know what to do in your life. If your father was uh, uh, a shoe cleaner, you were a shoe cleaner. Like all of this traditional way of thinking existed during this, 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 this because you didn't, you didn't question it. You don't question God, you don't question the order. This started to change about a thousand years after Augustus, or Augustus, Augustine of Hippo, with uh, another religious fellow called Thomas of Aquinas. Now, Thomas did it a bit differently. There was actually, yeah, Thomas was actually the person who brought Aristotle back to the West. And Aristotle dislikes the idea world. Aristotle believes there is an objective right. Like, there is something that is objective, but it's not in some idea world. It's in humans. Humans with their reasoning, with their rationality, can understand what's right. And from thinking, no, is this right? Um, of course, he, he don't himself don't say that everybody's going to do right. Uh, Aristotle is also an elitist. He also believed that only a few types of people could know what is right or wrong. And the big criticism of his day, or at least how we criticize him here, is he thought that slaves and women <laughs> couldn't have this ration. So uh, women, wrong with that. <laughs> yeah. So women weren't, weren't men, women weren't humans, and slaves weren't humans. Only mentally healthy males were humans of sorts, they could rationalize and, and know what's right and wrong. And this rightful mentality is like, <laughs> it's also very idealistic, but that's his way of seeing things. Uh, but what Thomas did with it was to understand that you can start rationalizing God. Meaning, if you had issues with understanding if God were true or not, well, Th well Augustus just said, yes, believe. Uh, Thomas said, ask, <clears throat> ask. Ask God if it's real. Test God if it's real. Because God is real. So if God is real, he will give you the answer. Now, I personally don't believe God is real, which actually led to a different era in the Western thought, where we start using Aristotle, start using uh, reason and empiricism and all these kind of new things that brought up to it because we start to question, rationalize everything. And in a way, this became more or less the death of traditionalism, little by little. It, took, it takes a little while for it to grow because the Catholic Church is big and massive. They don't want you to think this way. They like the old ways because it's simpler. But things start to come much quicker. Uh, yeah, Augustus of Hippo lived 350 to 430. Thomas of Aquinas lived 1225 to 1274. So about a thousand years in between these two people. Uh, but everybody was still Christian. Everybody in the, the 1300s were Christian. That started to come after the Protestant Revolution, after the Reformation. People started to actually th think of God not existing. Usually it started very small. It started with them de being deist, just questioning the God of the Bible itself. Um, but also they try to, within philosophy, try to use, um, oh my brain, 
Aristotle's ideas to rationalize a world without God and how morals and philosophy and ethics and all of this could exist without God, which was a rather new idea. I like to use Immanuel Kant for this one. Kant was a deist. He believed there was a creator, but he didn't believe that philosophy, that the, the, the idea of ethics, that what is right and wrong, needed a god that uh, um, that uh, Thomas and August kind of said. So he created another metaphysical world, kind of using Plato's idea in a way, which he said, there is this world where everybody's rational, and if everybody's rational, there will be a right way for a rational person to act. And that, in that ideal world, a person would do that. Therefore, a rational person in this world could, could think and understand what a per rational person would do in that fully rational world and act upon that. Which, in a way, was it created a system of pl Platonism before Augustus uh, of Hippo and in the way back to the old Greek way of thinking where philosophy and ideas existed without God that was had for a very long time and then so on and so forth more people started coming in talking about the existence of God Nietzsche whatever whatever just went on and on and on and little by little this created the world that we are in today a more secular world but the issue with these ideas and why in a way that we can also see that it can come a crash actually quite soon if we don't fix it is it's it's over rationalizing everything and now yeah it's over rationalizing which is an issue that 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 we play with today the world that we live in today, which is the postmodernist era, which I'm going to go into a little bit more later, is the world of over-rationalization. Uh, I would just like to add, add a little of my two cents there. Um, something that you, obviously, you will obviously see um, throughout this period, not only um, within the Christian era and also within the future, but through these uh, philosophical concepts, something that is unique to, to the West within philosophy, within these um, sort of ideas, these concepts, is that there is specifically this one rule, this one law of nature that transcends all legislation, that transcends all human law. Not all, everyone follows this objective law, no matter what. So the uh, Aristotelian natural law. Yeah. Aristotelian, no, yeah. Aristotle's natural law. Yeah, I think referred to as a higher law. Yeah, it's a universal law. It's universal law, right? Yeah. Well, I could be based on whatever fucking translation we're reading, but yeah. Yeah. But there is an objective right and wrong of sorts. And humans are humans. Except if you're a woman. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, we didn't invent anime now. Fuck anime. I mean, this is like the, the fun, the, the important part of knowing all of this is actually why West became as West did. Because you ask Banshee about anime, which is actually quite a good question. It's like, why did we grow in the way that we did and the Asians grew in the way they did? Asians has, uh, they, I don't think they have Plato and Aristotle, but they have other philosophical uh, people, uh, Confucius, for example, and Lao Tzu. That they play uh, is important. That's why family is even more important for the East than it is for the West. Is it Honor. because family. of their philosophy that they're considered to be stationary by economists like Adam Smith? Due to that, yeah, their their economy are more stationary because of those ideas. No, like um, because they believe in this harmony of yeah. Is it because they're considered to be stationary? Be st stationary because of that. 
I, I don't mean, you know, can see it once again through the like. W- w- what does Eastern philosophy, you know, teach? What it was that tradition all about? It's more or less all about conformity. With Confucian, yeah. it's more or less a restatement of family kin orientation, and this is still this is still practiced in China uh, today and South Korea. I'm not sure about North Korea. Uh, no, North Korea, basement. That's the best nation in the world. God damn it. Nazbol <laughs> <laughs> uh, game. Yeah, like, exactly, exactly. Uh, like Lao Tzu, you know, action through non-action. It's all about conformity. Mm. Okay. Mm. But, all right. So, all right, with 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 an understanding, like, uh, yeah, they don't have the same God as we did either. As we built ourselves on the monotheism, because most of our ideas, theories, political, oopsie oopsie oopsie, comes mostly from the Greek. And from the idea of God. Actually, holy shit, like if you really think about it, god damn those Greeks. They were sniffing some hell of a cocaine because we're still using it today. <laughs> sniff, sniff. Anyways, uh, should we go into the modern era a bit? Yeah. All uh, right. Uh, so let's talk about the Protestant Revolution and the Reformation. Which I would blame Thomas a bit for his over rationalization of things. Uh, but the mo- modernism in in the way that we have lived in quite a while started during, I would say, the uh, Industrial Revolution, at least a little bit after, not immediately, when uh, things away from the traditional way of seeing starting to remove itself little by little. Uh, it started, yeah, started from a traditional way of living, which is uh, your father owned a farm, and you worked, and then you, you 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 took over his farm, and you had babies, and yada yada yada. That's your existence. That's not very fun. Maybe you drank a little bit. Maybe you fucked a hooker. Eh, not much. But that's kind of it. But. With the Industrial Revolution happened a rather quick change, uh, especially in industry and work, that now you could work much quicker. You don't have to work in your father's farm anymore. You can uh, work in industry, get a well, bad conditions in the beginning, that changed. Uh, and all, over time, you can get you know, housing and all the kind of jazz that you, that you could do through industry. Even though, again, it wasn't good to live in shit conditions in the beginning, and it took quite a while until you actually could afford anything working in the industry. But it was still a big difference between your dad's farm and the city. Urbanization also started coming in. Uh, but because I like Max Weber, I also like Max Weber's idea of the Protestant ethic, which is uh, both about the Protestant work ethic and the idea of God. They kind of changed everything. And this change happened before the Industrial Revolution, but this brought forth the Industrial Revolution, which is the idea that you could work now, especially in Calvinism, you could work, but your work is no longer for God. While in Catholicism, you could be a nun and a monk, which means your entire existence is for the for God. On Protestantism, you can't do that. And you have no point doing that, especially in Calvinism, which is the idea that your you, there is no free will and your life is already set into a path by God, which ma- doesn't matter what you do, you're still going to hell or heaven. God have already decided before you were born. Oof. So this kind of made it that the I, the the person, became a bit of a interest again, and um, because we worked our asses off and not much happened, people got bored because I'm already going up or down. So they started to see meaning in life in a bit different ways, and that was through materialism. So this is now when materialism is starting to get important. Therefore, the Industrial Revolution happened because of materialistic thoughts. And uh, yeah, and through these materialistic ideas of obviously Marx and all the other Jingo Jango start to move in, which based around the same concept as religion does, which is a platonic worldview, but it's focused on the material more than God itself. Uh, 
but modernism I don't like Marx but modernism also brought in different other different things which uh, we use more today which is the removing of God and science like because before we did science to prove that God was real of sorts or to explain God's reality with these materialistic ideas we started doing science for us what they did for the for God himself we went to the natural realm <laughs> Started looking at the natural realm and not really caring about the over realm, uh, the heavenly realm. So different ideas start to grow up from that humanism, rationalism, imperialism, empiricism, not empiricism. Empiricism started to grow from it. And all of this brought in this new modern era where everything could be rationalized, everything could be explained. There's no need for God, no need for things, which also brought in you know, Marxist ideas of socialism syndicalism, communism, also, but also fascism, nationalism, because all of those are materialistic. Fascism and communism are both very materialistic. There are some religious aspects in them, but the majority of their core ideas are materialistic. So, and I would say that the, the era where traditionalism kind of fully died out, I would say it's after World War One, the death of monarchies in Europe. Because the majority of the Platonic ideas kind of died after that. Which is, you know, sad. Uh, so yeah, all those kind of things, yanny, yanny, yanny. Let's enter the postmodern era. <laughs> so now everything has been rationalized, everything has been explained without God, everything has, you know, everything works in a good formula. Now comes the 70s and 60s, when we start to over-rationalize, which is usually the aspect of postmodernism, what it does. You start to question things, you start to question institutions, start to question uh, gender binaries, start to question all these kind of things. Because you can, you always could. People are always kind of ask themselves, but the majority of people never went full out, they asked, and then they understood it and then they stayed. But they never stopped. They continued in a way a certain deconstruction. But there it does deconstruction isn't postmodernism for itself, but it's part of postmodernism of sorts. And yeah, we have Derrida and Foucault, which is the two big influences of postmodernism. Even though they didn't want to, they became. And that's very important to look at things. You shouldn't look at what they wanted, they should look what happened. Uh, so anyway, so, so all of this creates the postmodern idea. And with postmodernism also came ideas like post-culturalism, post-structuralism, post-colonialism, which kind of ended up in an anti-white sentiment, actually. The funny thing about post-colonialism is the idea that Previous colonies should get independence and be themselves, be their own identity, which is fine. But it just ended up with the Saudis and the Chinese colonizing them instead, and them not complaining because the colonizers are no longer white. Fucking stupid. But all this kind of uh, over rationalization through it all. It's also. Uh, Questioning the idea of monarchy, questioning the idea of everything, more or less. So, even though it came good things out of it, the good things that came out of it is actually an understanding of the world a bit better. Because, because we're criticizing of the institutions that exist, we can actually see the flaws and the good things about it. So, I'm hoping that in the future, in the future, though, with all of this criticisms of, of the current uh, institutional concept that exists, that we can learn from it and adapt it and make it better. That, 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 that will take a while and many things will be destroyed until that happens. Because we don't, we continue questioning it while we should stand still. All right, so to talk about the future a bit. So after post-modernism, uh, there will be something that we like to define as metamodernism, 
but we don't actually know this yet. <laughs> this is the future. But what I'm seeing and what I would like to take from this is something I like to call a bounce back. All right. Because I'm an absurdist, right? I live a lot in the ideas of the extreme ideas that life doesn't have a meaning. Life is useless and nihilism. I, I live in those ideas. I realm in those ideas. But many of the people within the school of existentialism, they have coping mechanisms. These different coping mechanisms is for me, an absurdist, is to accept the absurd. But other people have uh, a leap of faith which is Kierkegaard's idea. Uh, and this leap of faith is accepting things that you might not fully accept. As I like to say here, as, as Kierkegaard himself said, although religious himself declared faith in God to be absurd, since it's impossible to know God and to understand his purpose. But even though Kierkegaard said it's impossible to know God and kind of dumb to be religious, he still was religious because he still saw that the institution of religion itself is a necessity for existence, at least in the Western world, as it was in his time. It always changes, of course. I also like to, to mention Joseph de Mastre, who said that monarchism is, of course, unrational. It is, of course, it's dumb, quote unquote, but that everything is dumb. If you start to rationalize everything, over rationalizing everything will be quote unquote done but it's still an institution that is there for the existing of the civilization that we live in it's still a core principle that in the way that we live to make things go forward to make people not starve to death so while it's good to criticize and be critical it's not good to destroy for the sake of destroying so what met meta one of the aspects that I can see in metamodernism to bring up is the, is the bounce back, is to understand that things have to exist in certain ways. Genders, for example, must exist because there can't be seven million genders because that's fucking ridiculous. To understand these ideas and kind of understand Neoplatonic ideas that there is an idea world that is good, but not be Neoplatonic. Find somewhere in between between Aristotle and Plato. All right, that's what I got in my script. Hopefully, I that was useful somehow. Joe, I think that's pretty much it. Someone's channeling Nick Land. <laughs> yeah, really. Yeah, someone wrote that. That was cracking though. So yeah, the uniqueness of Western civilization is um, we question everything and we destroy everything. So ergo, accelerationism and until Actually, the point. That sounds like that sounds pretty Faustian to me. Yeah, we gotta destroy everything around us and build the AI God King. Yeah. Hey. What, 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 what does the stream need, old belly? Let's see. We will destroy a lot of things, but we the question is how far do we want to go down the abyss? Because going down too much can actually be in the death of a lot of people. And uh, is is that necessary to because you can go far enough that you never can bounce back again. So we must make sure that, that doesn't happen. No valid, no one's gonna, Chris's not gonna unblock you, you're an idiot, so no, it's not gonna. Were you, were you the guy who, like, I'm not sure it was him or someone else, but were you the guy who uh, DM'd Kurt, like, your fucking penis bulge? Because that was fucking, <laughs> that was pretty good. So I know fucking someone did that on Twitter. Yeah, we have a lot of dumb people. <laughs> okay, uh, should we end this here? Yeah, that's about good. Okay. All right, no other okay. comments? Otherwise, uh, all the comments, Voltaire, you listened to all of this before we yeah, quit? I was listening, didn't really have any real questions, but hey. No. Right. Okay, I hope everybody enjoyed their weekend. I hope people will enjoy, will get something out of this conversation. Uh, you want to shout yourselves out? Yeah, follow us on Twitter. I'm Joe and the Pullman. Give, give me money.
Give me all your Patreon money. Yeah, pay piggy. Pay piggy. Also, Ovale, never ask people for money on Twitter, even even if a joking matter, especially if this person is autistic in some manner. Wait, yeah, he asked Kurt for money? I don't know. If you ask him two or three.